welcome to another episode of by side hippies uh today i'm really excited to have uh, mr pawan gupta ceo and co-founder of betterhalf.ai uh you know it's a platform which helps you guys to find your better half or companion uh so mr pawan uh, gupta thank you so much for being here uh, i'm really excited to uh, like have you here uh so how are you doing pawan Uh, I'm doing pretty fine. So I just had my vaccination yesterday, uh, the first dose. So I believe many, many Indians will go through it, and you know, hopefully, we'll be safe, we'll be back to the safe environment again. So I'm pretty excited about, I think, this interview, and I'm rooting for, I think, the 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 happiness of, I think, all of us. What I am really excited about is your recent fundraise about two weeks back, where you raised uh, in pre-series A round about three million dollars from one of the biggest investors, S2 Capital, Quai Capital. Kunal Shah was one of the investors in your uh, in your fundraise. So yeah. congratulations uh, on that, Pawan. Uh, Pawan, I will request you if uh, you can just help me understand what is Better Half uh, dot AI. What is the problem you guys are trying to solve here? Can you help me through your journey? Yeah. So first of all, while talking about this three million three series around, I saw a lot of excitement on your face. uh you know what i see is typically we aren't excited um, and i think we see that as a mistake uh we see these rounds as a journey from what you want to do as something why we start this company to where we want to take it and these are kind of good of kind of like you know it takes a time there's a vehicle it goes in a highway and you you go to a petrol pump and you got to fuel it and then you know you know you can go another 100 200 miles so typically uh, generally we fund raise pretty fast and we typically forget it um i don't recall we had a celebration or something we said hey guys thank you we did our job let's get back to where we are and users i think the culture if you look into better half i think uh, talking to users has never changed uh, i think in your interview you use ceo or you know the co-founder uh these are least important things actually when you want to focus on uh, a mission that you want to do and i think anybody has to genuinely feel that and i'm lucky that my co-founder and i we are equally aligned on we are building it for users first keeping our employees and their productivity in place and obviously the next stakeholders like you know right. uh, investors and everybody you know come in um so i can cover the product uh, feel free to like ask any uh, very you know specific you know questions i'm more than happy to cover it one by one Sure. So, can you please, uh, firstly, uh, just help me understand since uh, it's a platform for finding uh, uh, companionship, yes. and you know, uh, uh, it's a love tech platform. What is the unique selling proposition in your product, yeah. and how is it uh, differentiable from other existing products in the market? If yeah. you can, help yeah, me. yeah. I like this word love tech. Wow, this is um, one of the rarest I think interviews which has used this word love tech. Maybe I can take some learnings from here. Uh, but I think it's very simple to understand. Uh, India has three markets. Um, the market number one is the market of casual dating. Uh, you know, which is where um, uh, Indians in the uh, in the in the early stage of you know at the age of twenties you know use these products like Tinder and so forth. And Tinder obviously has the market share of you know, in that age group. Yeah, right. The the second market is the market of serious dating you know which is where bumble uh, okay cupid hinge uh, we believe il i think they compete in that same segment where users in mid 20s you know use uh, you know this product the third market which used to be matrimony which is very really specific and local to india um and this is where i think the giant traditional matrimonial sites uh, you know we have top 3 okay out there uh, there will some really great products uh you know out there that were mainly designed about 15 year or two decades uh, before uh we think that uh, these were designed keeping parents in mind so if you look into the i think the market of serious dating and traditional matrimony there is a space and that's when the urban indians that niche their needs are very different and that india needs some modern new age matrimony app designed for them keeping this control to them i think that's when better half is actually placed very nicely right 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 so as i understand it is uh, it is a mix of uh, serious dating and casual dating and let's the user decide i believe where they position themselves or is there more or, or am i getting it right here uh yeah so i think if you uh, let me talk about the positioning so we call better half as india's first and only matrimony app that's designed for urban indians 
without the direct involvement or influence of parents. So what happens, we have taken them from back seat to front seat. And when they come in, this is the first thing that they get, clean network where they have this control. The second thing that you know, they get it, we designed the fastest experience for them to get matched. So we invented world's fastest tech called single click matching technology. Uh, we hold a US patent application. Okay. I think other six to nine months is when we'll, we'll be awarded the patent. That's what we believe. Okay. Um, and what it does, this takes very minimalistic data, which is just your name, your gender, your date of birth or age, that's it, which is what Spotify or any music app would take. And then it combines with our own models and it predicts your religion, your mother tongue, your community, your height estimation, uh, age estimation, your partner preference, and some basic you know, behavioral traits. And this is about, so this is 16 traits that we predict in a magical one click, which takes few seconds and your matches gets ready. This has never happened in the world. Wow. We gave it, now it has been tested in India with over 3 lakh users or so over the last uh, nine to 12 months, ever since we released this tech. Uh, we will appreciate it. Uh, this is, I think, uh, this is why they also like this quick experience. Um, I think the third part is actually they get matched, uh, not just based on you know, releasing our community, which people tell us it's important to them, but they get matched based on their behavioral traits, their likes and dislikes. And so we also happen to be the India's first product that gives them the compatibility information between people. There's a thin line. Uh, we don't. We only give a directional data based on what users have told about themselves. But I think this is a unique thing. And we see that this need is a very growing need among people. If you're looking for, let's see, a salsa dancer or somebody likes pizza or somebody likes but let's show on Netflix or somebody's a tea lover. I think these are very unique needs that you can't really capture through the factual information. So that's something we capture. Um, obviously there was a team of, you know, I think domain experts, human behavior, uh, some of the folks, uh, Mikhail Parsons at Stanford University, uh, who has been in this, uh, I think, uh, the subject for last 10 years uh, when I was involved. Um, and I think, so I covered three points. And I think the fourth point uh, is people tell us that the quality of profiles that you get on better half, and, and this is a very subjective, but let me break it down. The okay. quality means verification of the profiles, authenticity of the information that they have mentioned. I think a good career in terms of which school did they went to, uh, what company are they working into, the, their income group. I think all of these gives a sense of impression of an authentic profile and a good pool of professionals that somebody is talking to. And I think this is what they get compared to the different products. Uh, and the last thing is actually of these profiles uh, is actually seriousness to matter. So the community is quite strong because mostly we cover you know, users between 25 to 35. Uh, men, you know, median age is 29, 30. Uh, you know, women, median age is 27, 28. So we see it's a very right balanced product you know, for these users providing a holistic experience for their marriage needs. Got it. Got it. Uh, so, Pawan, uh, like, as I understand, you built a product yes. where people, uh, unlike, let's say, shadi.com or jeevansai.com, where parents also get involved into your uh, scene, yeah, which, yeah. Uh, which is only meant for people to, like, explore, make these individual profiles. And as you mentioned, you have these 16, uh, yeah. filters, like, uh, which yeah. is the first things which have been done, which have... Uh, all these filters are not even there, even in a Bumble, or uh, I would believe other like dating apps as well. So this is something very unique, and I also believe you use artificial intelligence mm -hmm. uh, in your uh, in your in your uh, platform to basically yes. make these matches happen, which is uh, sort of very very interesting. Uh, but uh, Pawan, I also uh, have a question on very similar. Sure. Lines. So yes, what have been the challenges? You know, like. Uh, in like uh, making this platform, like are users very reluctant uh, to give out their personal data on the, on this app, or how yeah. do you really convince or create this genuinity or credibility in in these users? How do you incentivize them to sign up on your platform? Because I believe uh, you know uh, privacy is a very big issue, you know, in today's time. Mm -hmm. So how do mm -hmm. how do you go about uh, verification and you know process of incentivizing people to give out this information? information? Uh, yeah, I think good question. So first of all, we don't need to incentivize. So if you see, actually the answer is not in business. 
so if you're doing a right job, if you're serving your users well in their interests, and you're probably transparent about it, yeah. I don't think you, do, you, you need to incentivize. However, what is needed is a clarification. Look, people's privacy is their privacy, so is my privacy. So is, you know, uh, half of our team members use better half. So is their privacy. So we've got to respect that. I think what you're only asking, any set of information that you give to any app, like any music app, yeah. better half would take less data than that. Uh, and this is your data. It's only going to be used to match you with the other potential people, which ultimately leads to a certain number of you know high rate of connections and chats. And then our job is done, you know, for this for only for matchmaking part. Okay. And then we just want to make you successful. We never use this data to give it to any company or any third party. I have all, already stated that's a complete no from my side. So that's a zero tolerance we're talking about. Next, I think for the safety, uh, you know, for this concern, we are a US-based company. Obviously, we started this company in the US when we were there before we moved to India. And then Indian subsidiary obviously is operational, uh, which takes all the operations. And so I think before the laws of India, we are governed by the laws of the US, which is way more, I think, strict. And we got to follow that. Uh, so I think as a user, you should never concern, never be concerned about it. But also let me give you a factual information to clarify. We only need your name. I believe we should have it. Uh, we, on, we need your date of birth to verify your age and we need your gender. If you give us these three information, we think we can bring you to the product where we ask you more information to add your profile, get matched with. But more than that, you do not need anything to start your journey you know, with better Hub app. Got it, got it. Got, I, I now understand uh, how this uh, process works. Uh, I now have this very interesting question uh, on the basis sure. of what I read uh, some time back. Uh, so I was reading in India, especially, you know, match.com's Tinder, uh, the male, the female to male ratio is somewhere on for every one female, you have 10 males uh, on the platform. Similarly, uh, on Bumble, Bumble, I believe is one of the most, I would say, uh, I would say gender neutral uh, dating platform. It has for every three women, it has about seven uh, male people, 30 to 70 ratio is split. Uh, how is the split in uh, at, at, at the moment at better half AI? And you know, as I, I would like to believe that uh, the best case scenario is for like one woman to one man in this platform. So, and how do you plan to sort of, you know, uh, grow and incentivize more women to sign up, uh, which I believe drives the demand for, uh, I would say, like men signing up on the platform since it's a two-sided market here, as I understand. If you can just give me some, like, what are your thoughts on it? Sure. Um, so looking to these two numbers, we think we have surpassed these numbers on Pelleha. Yeah. Uh, we maintain between uh, 30 to 35 percent females uh, yeah. on our platform, even at a scale of cumulative 700K users or so per month. Today, slightly more than 1.5 lakh users use our product, which I think it's nicely one month, but we're maintaining this number. This is that a challenging journey, yes, but let's see what are we doing today for women and what we plan to do for them you know, to further scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I think first is, uh, I remember a call that happened. So, there, so this person was a marketing manager at PayPal. And this happened two years back, better have app version one. Okay. And uh, we have always, you know, spoken, you know, we talked to users. So users have talked to CEO. It was there on the website. Now it's there on the app. So this female scheduled a call with me and I said, hey, how, how can I help you? And how can I build a product for you? And she said, uh, I don't recall the name, but she said, I'll never use that. I, I said, thank you for telling me that. I would want to know why. I'd love to you know, see. And she said, this design is not up to the mark. It doesn't give me this fear and impression that it's women friendly. And hey, there are a ton of hygienic things that are actually missing. Hey, the positioning is actually bad and so, so, so forth. And then I said, man, this was not good. So, you know, so that's how if you see the current version better half uh, version two came in. Uh, this is a good, talking about good 18 months, um, yeah, you know, in terms of entire planning and good one year of exactly all KM users. Uh, live and scaling and everything. But before that, there was a tremendous six months of planning that happened. Uh, uh, externally, we were doing bad, right? You know, internally, we know we were 
doing it one by one, you know, to solve a certain problem. So I think what we have done, first of all, look, anybody, whether you're women or men, you want quick gratification. Today, we live in the world of, let's see, YouTube, right? Or, you know, we used to have TikTok, right? Now we have another local, like, you know, apps. Uh, but we want something very, very fast. So that's what, in this industry, this is the first time that we said one click, that's it. So we made it magic for you. And I said, why don't you look, this is about 85% accurate or so. So if somebody is looking, okay, for, for let's see certain community or language or age group or salary group, you'll, you'll be magically surprised that how did this come up? You did not even give any data. And this is what happens. And wow. we're very happy that this, this is live. And wow. then people, then we ask them, oh, would you want to give more information because the other person is going to look into your profile and it will make you more serious and so forth, you know, it happens. Um, coming to this, I think currently we are doing, I think uh, two or three things. Um, first is if you look into design, it's very, it's on the line of pink. And I was leading the design team when this came up and I, I just couldn't obviously want a female uh, person when I was working in my team. And I said, look, I don't understand this when I'm willing to take this bet, uh, but it's just for men, pink is just too much, right? It's it's, it doesn't come very naturally, but they took this call. Uh, it has been appreciated nicely after one year of entire delivering this product. And now if you see lately, if you look into our Instagram page or so, it's becoming more and more vibrant and colorful. So you have this purple, you have this pink, you have certain blue. So we, are, we want these people to feel and play with these colors. We just feel, okay, this is very warm and soothing product. That's one. The next is when we looked into our data, females told us, Give me compatibility. I want to know more and more about this person. So Rahul, my co-founder, was the one who designed. And this is how the compatibility matching, which is about 10 dimensions now. How do you match on family level, values, humor, romance, travel, settle down timeline? There's 10 such dimensions, which is life. So for every user, you can see that. And backed by the content, which are the areas you masked, why? Which are the areas you, know, you unmasked and why? And and I think that's when you know you can have you can relate to this before you talk to someone. So that's the second thing. Third is I think we have advanced our fraud detection. Uh, again, this was a crazy engineering work that we did, and we think it's one of the most advanced fraud detection systems. Talking about in the entire country in this industry, despite a very small team, and our folks, you know, some of the advisors uh, and investors, like you know, who work at let's see, uh, you know, companies at Facebook or Apple, my co-founder a set of engineers, they got involved in, and they said, how do we make sure that females don't really see a fake profile? And it is now defined, not just based on your selfie verification, which is we do, but it's also based on your product behavior. It's based on your messaging behavior. That's when this almost a real time detection happens. So today, obviously we do it manually, but gradually we're moving very fast to a real time detection that if we sense it, better half, don't ask questions, you first unverify and then we ask questions. So taking actions is something is at the heart of what we are doing, you know, here. And they said, okay, now let's correct that first. So we do, we're doing three things. Uh, I think now going forward to your last question, if you see the end of the year, uh, you will see some exclusive things is something I want to do. So today the product is entirely free for, for women. Uh, so you won't realize uh, we, uh, we are just publicizing it now. Uh, but we're testing this. So females don't pay uh, you know, to us and neither they have a paid feature. We said, we are going to build the product to retain you. But over time, more and more exclusive features related to safety, related to more control, related to more matching will be coming you know, to females. Got it. Got it. So now I understand why you have probably one of the highest female to uh, male ratio, which is great. Uh, I think this is, I think, one of, the, one of the leading products, uh, I think, in the market as compared to other, like, in terms of this metric. And I also there is one more. There is one more. Um, people don't know, but if you look into, we are about, we are 30, 35 people. I think our female distribution is, uh, is, is more than 40% in the team today. It's actually heading towards 45%. Okay. And this was a big problem. This number was zero you know, three years back. And we said, no, this is not how I'm going to build this. So what happens, uh, so we are actually elevating all the female leaders within the company, customer success, uh, you know, marketing, right? These are typically a lot of females are not there. But I think within the product, obviously, we'll be looking to partner with more female leaders. Our QA team is like by females. 
So I think uh, we see a lot of things so that we don't miss. Ultimately, we're building it you know, for, for people and especially uh, females. Uh, you know, who are, if you look into total online internet distribution in urban India, right, about not more than 25, 30% of uh, those distribution is, you know, is, is come from females. So, so it's a very hard supply and demand problem. So naturally, like you have to go exclusive and then you have to be very friendly and then you have to tell them this is the best product okay, out there for your marriage need. I think that's when you start solving okay, the, these problems you know, holistically. Got it, got it. And uh, now I see what makes it so differentiable and why there are more women you know, signing up on your platform and why these mm-hmm. investors see so much value in your product. I'm not talking about investors, uh, Pawan. Uh, of course, I other- think we make revenues, so I'll tell you, right? Um, why? So look, we don't build this. I tell it to investors. Uh, we, we don't build the company for investors. All investors know and they all partner You know, whenever we reach to the right stage. Uh, like I only have three things that I look for. One is, are we uh, delivering the best product out there in the market for the users that we want to serve, serve for the needs we want to capture um, and cater to? Number one, are our employees going to be happy? Okay, here in terms of, it's a tough time, right? Corona, better half is one of the history of really turning around this company, you know, in a year. Uh, and I told my team will be one of the rarest ones that will come out of this country. Um, and so like, how are they inspired? Are they productive? Are they being, you know, are we being respectful to them? You know, and when they talk to their peers, do they feel like really, uh, you know, accomplished, you know, coming over here? So I think that's two things that is super, super key. And, right. and the third thing which we have added recently, so four or five months back, we got into Y Combinator and then it was a tr- three months good accelerator program yeah. that we went to. And I think one thing that we learned, we were missing the P and L part while planning. So we said, hey, product and engagement and retention. And YC said, this is a very good example of how fraud happens. And fraud means like you have users and product, but there is no revenue. And instead you start with revenue. So uh, we are very 100K in annual income. We grew 10 times, we're at 1 million run rate. And YC said, you start with revenues. And now we measure very deeply on our P&L on our gross margins, on how we are doing month on month, our burn rate is super in control. Many times I've heard this feedback that this is one of the companies that is quite sharp on unit economics. And just and typically before Series A, uh, companies don't think that wise. And we said, no, we want to think about this. I would never do a premature scaling. I think on a scaling that lasts and sustains. When you have a horizon of let's say 10 years or so, then these things become very, very important. That hey, I'm not here to build and go, right? I'm here to like change things, you know? So uh, I think these three things are, are fundamentals of how we run the company. I've actually, I've actually heard people uh, like investors with their founders uh, who are building, uh, who are building something like a, a vitamin, uh, you know, uh, like uh, something like an aspirin and not a vitamin. Uh, you know, like, so that is great to like understand how you sort of view the, like view investors and how you, you know, view your product. And- uh, I, I would like to actually add to it. Uh, actually, there's a podcast from Reed Hoffman on this point. And actually you should be building for both. And the reason is, let's see better half at some point would become a platform for all your marriage and so forth needs. Obviously we'll unlock it uh, at some point in future. Uh, once our experiments goes to a certain stage, but some matchmaking is, is definitely the aspirin part, right? It's when you have the need of a companion, the need is very strong, you pay, but this need is typically six months to a year, right? About a year journey, and the need is very strong. And that's why they pay. And that's a sound way, you know, to at least start. But you also see that sometimes they need vitamin and over time they will need aspirin. And it's always a mix of two vitamins, one aspirin, two aspirins, one vitamin, and you keep on going and you have suite of products and services that actually comes out. And I think the typical example I would think on Amazon, maybe you don't, sometimes you don't need products, but you still buy it. It's kind of a vitamin, but when you need it, it's also there. So maybe that's, you have to be really thinking on the needs part. And let's see, uh, as you move to a platform approach, generally both could be uh, a good approach you know, to, to, to handle uh, you know, usage, I think. Got it. What better way if you have both a vitamin and a 
like your aspirin so, <laughs> it's great to have in your in your medical toolbox uh so uh pavan uh thank you for this really amazing and elaborate uh, answer uh pavan i would want to uh, take you to the next uh, part of the podcast which is about your fundraise uh and i just wanted to understand since you've done three series in now which is a very big deal so how does a fundraise look like look like how intense is it what sort of questions do investors ask you what sort of hard questions you have to answer prove to them if you can just maybe like give me a broad overview of how it actually works out it's a very interesting thing i was wondering yeah 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 so i'll be honest about this right so one is uh i have been fundraising right for four years uh do i like it the answer is no <laughs> and do i want to do it uh, the answer is no but when you have man you got to grow this company and you want to partner with and you know some of the investors who also want to partner with you that's when you said okay let me do it even though it's not my first choice and over time i find it to be a right reasoning that it's a good reason that you are not building for investors neither investors want they are not our users so i think as you should think on the focus that why did you start this company right number one um how far do you want to take this what's this and then um, i think the next view is are you looking to make it a let's see a fairly small business and which is profitable like running a restaurant and that's itself a good goal uh, we have in this country we have if not lakhs and millions on all these small entrepreneurs and who are doing quite well right and their families and these are awesome folks um versus do you want to build a large company which will require a capital and you will need more and more partners which are in this case it's the financial partners uh, in order to work with right so uh, you know media typically like really likes these news right you know hey this is a new thing funding happened as a company i think we should be little careful uh, that yes if it helps you in let's see bring more users hiring branding building more trust it's a right reason so if you just go back better half was published by hundreds of uh, you know i think journalists exactly 2 years back and think into this did nobody reach out to us in 2 years the was answer one. possibly is it was totally no okay uh, it was not but but i said we took a call no pr no pr because it was not serving a goal we said if you don't have a great product if you don't have a users community if you're not solving some core needs and ultimately it's not reflecting in revenues then typically you don't have some great signs of a product market fit how does a pr help here right so good 700 days hmm. i had to say no 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 this is not the goal of the company and even when some of the journalists stated and wanted we said sorry we are not releasing any news right no it's okay. at this stage we aren't ready but when we were ready we said we will not have a stop button we only got to turn it on now this time we turned it on and said it doesn't stop now i want to talk to everybody because if product is scaling nicely and people are telling they don't know about us that's our mistake we got to do more to build that trust so i'm solving a problem here so i think as an entrepreneur we should be thinking about any time like what problem are you solving cool. um, i want to come back to your main question for an investor obviously we went and the reason is uh, before y combinator happened we just raised 1.2 million dollars last year which only took 10 months of my fundraising time the 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 slowest i would have ever done in the covid time so last year i was i fundraised for almost an entire year um, we had a time when we had two or three months of runway which ultimately we were like we'll never do that because some employees started panicking and we were like we can't do that i can operate with a 30 day runway but somebody who's having a job maybe it's very hard you know as a safety net we said okay so let's solve it forever so we just before we got into yc we had 15 to 18 months of runway and we were like yc happened what do we do now so then yc happened and we had a call with our partner and we said maybe we don't need money but then we discuss what are the future plans what are the challenges that looks like how does the series a looks like and then it came out that we should raise some buffer fund and when i opened the round uh, so i opened 1.5 million dollar round which was subscribed in 72 hours and uh, so we were one of the most trending ones within the y combinator batch because of attraction and everything so we said man this got subscribed what do i do 
Then our advisor and investor said, then raise more because now we can do more. So we can accelerate some of the plans that we wanted to do next year. So this 1.5 became three. And then even some of the more investors wanted to talk to us, even I see some sometimes reach, but we said, hey, no, we are not focused. So when you focus, right? You always think, are you in fundraising mode or not? You have to decide on that. If you're in that mode, you're in fire. And people find me that it's kind of a little different power at this point in time because he just says yes or no. And at that time, it's an intense emotion that actually happens. Uh, but when this fundraising actually ends, so which took three weeks of time for us, then I'm back to guys. I'm back here. I'm talking to users. Hey, how is our like weekly plans going out? How, how can I help? How can I help in hiring? Who is leaving? Can I stop that person? So, you know, I like this part, which is day-to-day -day challenges. Uh, these are, I think, very interesting things you know, to do. Very interesting how the 1.5 million round turned to a 3 million round. Uh, it's very interesting. We want, to, we want to raise uh, zero. So we <laughs> said, hey, we have two as much of runway or so. We don't need money. Yeah, and I then YC partner partner said, you're stupid. So I said, okay, let's raise something. And then said, okay, then you raise more because, you know, there's a change in valuation, something that happened. You said, okay. And what, what really happened that some of the things that we wanted to do post series A is something now we are doing potentially one year before because of that. Right. I was uh, especially like, I was so scared when you said you are just 20 days of runaway cash left <laughs> and you were okay with it and your employees were like, not. And I was like, oh my God, uh, this is like so close. <laughs> oh, uh, so you didn't say 20, it was, uh, I think uh, in the past I've survived with 45 days. Uh, and this time it was 60, 60 to 90 days. Wow. So, uh, and I was okay. I'm like, I'm, I would be okay until like one week. I said, hey, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So, but I don't expect more people to be that okay. <laughs> <laughs> Adventures of being, uh, you know, an entrepreneur, you know, like working with these uncertainties and still being okay with it, accepting it and moving on. Uh, I mean, that's a <laughs> Like I'm already learning so much from you, uh, just by interacting with you. So, and Pavan, uh, like you also mentioned, you know, when you did a startup uh, before your first startup, uh, you talked yeah, about, yeah. you learned what not to do when you start up. And then when you went to MIT, uh, you spoke about, I learned what to do when you do a startup. So can you please share yeah. some of your uh, insights? on these two very interesting perspectives you have developed? Yeah, um, I think majorly my first, uh, so if you look into my background, right, I'm, come from a tier two town, so is my co-founder, um, kind of like similar, like, you know, we complete our words, uh, you know, we have five different set of personality hills. He's more nice that way and I'm more direct that way. So like over time, I have become slightly nice and he has become slightly direct. So I don't know, it's a good, like, you know, compliment over time. Uh, so we enjoy that. Uh, but I think uh, my first startup was an ethics startup providing services to school to assess their non-academic areas of their students. Bootstrap. Um, I just, uh, I didn't feel like having a job at the time of recession 2009. Uh, that's the time I graduated from engineering, uh, you know, back then about 10 years, well, wow, 11 years back. Um, I think two and a half years was crazy, like, you know, just, just a lot of actually, I think, emotional stamina that was needed, you know, to run a five or small, five or 10 people team. Uh, one year was huge trouble. Second year, we had a product. We started making revenues. Um, third year, we ran into scalability issues, which is we couldn't grow from one state to another. But I think that was just like the way as you just, look, you'll never be ready, right? I think Tim Cook and one of his comments, comments in that address at Stanford said, you'll never be ready. So I think a retro in, in hindsight was like, great, you jumped in, then you at least see kind of like the uncertainty, not a well-managed company, at least was fine. Um, then obviously I had a knack of, you know, some, doing some inventions and over time, I think applied to MIT and MIT was kind enough, you know, to take me. Um, so still share, I think one of the best relationships with this institution. Uh, the head of the admissions, you know, became friends and over time, I still, still a friend. Uh, then, uh, and uh, so MIT, I was actually not attending a lot of classes, but I was flying, you know, back and forth to Bay Area and Silicon Valley. And I was learning from many projects. Um, but first was about like my first startup um, was about like what really not to do like in this case we didn't have a great product we didn't have a plan 
uh, you know, how do we get from one city to another? We didn't have funds. Uh, the revenues we didn't have planned. We were not measuring the success metrics, right? We were managerially very not smart. So I think all of these was first exposure, but this the first job that I got, which was one of the best, I think, offers that I had. Um, very good company, with all due respect, right? It was an all tech friend, Series A, who doesn't want to work. Uh, and then I worked over there. And I think the company really, I think it had a very good culture, but the culture took a very different note uh, when the financial problems came in. Uh, so I saw that, like, you know, when you decide and when you don't think analytically, don't break down the problem, don't give a clear directions to people, don't really have a buy-in, uh, that's when uh, I would say you may not have a really great team who believes in a certain vision. And I think that was a mistake that you shouldn't do. And I think really not really keeping people apprised of the financial issues, because if it's there, people come back and solve this together. Um, we had one. And... If you don't believe, I brought all the team. I said, man, this is all our salary. It doesn't want to last in 60 to 90 days. What should we do? And I'm working hard on this. Uh, except one or two, I think everybody actually believed in it. And I was surprised to it. And obviously, we turned around, right? It's the same. This is the same team. So this happened. And then eventually, obviously, I lost my job. And uh, you know, all of a sudden, right, you get laid off. Uh, but it was a good experience. And I think I was partly responsible because maybe I'm not that valuable even though it was a short four or five months. But the next one that happened, I had a chance to see a Series B, a Series C company, about 130 people, how well managed in terms of directions, managerial skills, who does what, the ownership. I think this is what I really learned. Uh, and then next problem came in, my visa problem. Uh, so which was not in my control, uh, but ultimately my mentors got involved. And I think to your first question, this is how Better Half came in. My colleague said, which problem do you believe in? Do you want to do it? And my same managers now comment on LinkedIn, that on good job. And I stayed best manager indeed, right? So, so and this was the time I started my partner search. Rahul, my friend then, we were sharing the same in our apartment. A same room, actually. His engagement broke. We faced this and we were like, man, maybe we can do something about this. It was a good one year of consideration. Uh, of this entire journey before we planned that this is the problem that we're more excited about solving. And we want to do it for ourselves. We, are, we want to do it for our friends. And eventually now we're doing it for their friends and their friends, their friends. And that's what, you know, you have these urban millennials, but I call it, look, I'm not possibly doing it for the goal of urban millennials. I'm doing it for my friends. It's still, I think that feeling has not changed. Got it, got it. No, no, it's a very good. I'm sure people who are watching this will also learn from your journey then. Like, or setbacks at home, but you've got to be okay with, uh, you know, all these, which makes you the person you want to be. But I'm sure this idea probably would not have even, like, occurred, like, you know, if you didn't go through that grind, initial grind, initial setback. Yeah, actually, what happens when user complains, I think the first thing that you get is an empathy, right? So I tell it, guys, it's us. It's not that user. If the user has any problem, right, look into this hard journey, right? Partners with people are generally anxious, you know? Sometimes it's frustration, sometimes it's disappointment. These are crazy emotions that we're talking about, sometimes anger. So how do you deal with it? Because that now the user has certain hope from your product. You can't treat the user the same way. So you just have to be very nice, calm, right? Just being helpful, keep listening to them. And eventually these users become fans. Uh, today, I think we did an Instagram Live, uh, one of the relationship coach. These are three-year relationships that we enjoy. Some of the users said, I want to come live you know, with you guys because I really like this team and this product. We said, sure, thank you for it. I think this is a community. And I think once you have a community, I think you have really created something amazing. And I think this is what I'm more interested in you know, over the next one year to you know, advance and strengthen with this community. I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, Rupavan, like you've built such a great product and the numbers speak for themselves about how interesting that you know the way it's growing right now it's going to be the next growth story in the love tech as i used before you, know, you said uh, if you are embarrassed by your product you've launched at the right time uh, otherwise you are a bit late and uh, you know i just wanted to understand you know can you elaborate uh, how can you know one uh, test if one has launched their product at the right time in the right market if you can give some perspective on it, how can you stress that? Um, uh, yeah, I think it has to do with the mindset, right? So if you, let's see, if you're working in a startup, you know, we have this culture, right, in our documentation and we'll, we'll call, we'll get in one sync and we'll write spec. And one of the product advisors joined and I said, this is the bunch of idiots 
Okay, so the more they plan, the more they're taking time away from users to see the product and the more they just allow competitors. Okay, and who is, who, who will always have more money and resources or something. So startups should never operate that way. And I said, you know what guys, stop the documentation. So you're gonna solve these problems at this stage. Anytime you're being delayed, okay, by shipping something, you are thinking too much, too out loud, which is not the right problem that you are solving. Here you are fighting for time. So I think, let me read this. What does the advantage that a startup has, right? That a big company doesn't. Focus, I believe it's a very focused team. We're doing the same thing for four years, two years, good journey, last year, crazy journey. So we think we are focused and we have good, we are strategic. We have planned on this. But I think the speed, if you don't have, you just allowed, you know, users not to have great product from you and also allowed, you know, uh, some of the other products that users use so that they can, they want to ship products. Can you stop them? No. So I think when you have to, when you have to really think on the timing is could this be the fastest and keep it very lean. Who is the clear owner? Who is this person going to work with in terms of the product design, QA, front and back end? Close it. Okay. And most close it has to happen verbally. Only do just bare minimum documentation that helps you in the next set of features and don't plan too long. So as a company today, I'll tell you, yes, in a long-term vision, yes, we do know where do we want to go in five or 10 years, but I don't have a plan more than 90 days. And if anybody asks, I say, them, I don't know. And then my team says, they don't have a plan more than 30, 60 days. And I said, that's a good stage you are in. So right now, better have only things 30 day, 30 day cycle. And then we distribute it to week on week cycle. What we want to do this week and next week, that's it guys. And every two weeks, you should know what's going to happen in the next two weeks. Okay. And then we know where we are heading to. And if you operate with this speed, you are you don't have like your favorite two weeks, right? Maybe two, two or four weeks is actually gone. So you're practically, you don't, you don't, you have, you have hardly even 50 weeks to make a change. And let's see one feature takes if not on average two weeks, you can't ship more than 25, okay? And out of 25 features, half of them is gonna be bug infrastructure or something. So you have 12 shots in a year. Cool. And, and that's a win or a lose shot that you have. Cool. Now you have to be wise on those 12 shots. Cool. Okay, so, so you should be rather, I think if you look into this, uh, I think frankly thinking on delaying your launch or embarrassment or something, these are, I think, detail. You are dying. As a startup, you're bound to die. So I think go and ship it, ask your users. And even if you've shipped a bad product, at least they give you a quick feedback and you change it with iterations, actually some of the product match yours. If you look into our matching algo, it's on 14th version that we have changed. If not, we would have done our pricing changes four or five times to understand. The, the different campaigns that we have done, maybe five or six times in the last three, four months, just to understand the behavior in terms of uh, I think some of the crazy features that we have shipped, compact really feature, it took us six weeks. And my co-founder was like, I can't give more than six weeks to ship this feature with ultimately uh, change the retention game for females. Our retention for females is, uh, you know, 47% day 30, which we believe is the highest in the industry. Generally companies are doing 30, 35%. So we, we start, I think we think about this. Uh, I hope I addressed your question, uh, you know, in a startup style. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Pawan, for just letting us have a sneak into the mind of the entrepreneur like you all. And it was like great interaction. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll also maybe stop recording now.